I feel that seven day Chan retreats are indeed beneficial to the body and mind. But sometimes we meet participants who are hard to get along with, which makes it unbearable. That's right. Once during a seven-day retreat, I sat near the exit of a Chan Hall, where a breeze was blowing. It was a very warm day, I was suffering from heat stroke and had a terrible headache, and feeling cold from the slightest breeze. I was barely able to tolerate the situation. I suffered alternating states of coldness and warmth. It was truly unbearable, which was why I sought help from the volunteers. I wrote a note to the assistant timekeeper to see if I could have a gua sha treatment or change seats. But after reading the note, the assistant timekeeper frowned, looking very fierce and very stern. She also shook her head vehemently, rejecting my request. I was kind of startled by that. Up to now, I can still clearly remember how startled I was. So I would like to make a suggestion to Fashu that to be an assistant timekeeper, one must be gentle and take care of the needs of the retreatants. It makes sense that the assistant timekeeper should be gentle, However, you requested a gua sha. Don't you find that too much to ask? But at least I should be able to change my seat, right? I don't think the assistant timekeeper did anything wrong. After all, why would anyone request a gua sha during a retreat? Moreover, there's limited space in the Chan Hall. Had you been allowed to change seats, does that mean we should allow others to do so as well? That's not very empathetic of you. This will scare off the retreatants. When practicing Chan, aren't we supposed to practice compassion? What do you think, Fa Shu? Am I not right to say that? Well, while describing that experience, did you realize that you were trying to alter the environment? That is, you were hoping to get a gua sha treatment or change seats to satisfy your wishes. That's true, but that is because I was feeling extremely unwell. Had it not been dealt with, I wouldn't have been able to sit properly at all. Isn't an assistant timekeeper supposed to help retreatants practice with peace of mind? Had she not failed in her responsibility? After that, I ran into her a few times. Every time I saw her, I felt uncomfortable. Well, yes. This is how most people would react. But, have you observed that this incident has already long since passed? Suppose that the assistant timekeeper has since improved herself. That would be her own self-improvement. Have you figured out any ways you could improve from this experience? Improve? Improve in what way? I mean, when you are reflecting on this incident, there is in fact room for improvement. Have you discovered anything? I know. Fa Shi is talking about the mother in your mind is not the real mother. However, I feel that when having to respond to situations, we can't apply a certain fixed concept. To narrow our thinking and responses to the mother in your mind is not the real mother. I heard about that once in Fasher's Dharma talk, but I think it's only a theory. You are right. A concept isn't something we use to confine our thinking. In fact, the mother in your mind is not the real mother is not only a concept, but is the truth emerging from realization. Let me ask you, how long ago did this happen? Uh, about two years ago. How many people did you speak to regarding this incident? How did you feel when you spoke about it? More than ten, I think. I've been on so many retreats, yet I've never encountered such a harsh and rigid assistant timekeeper before. Up to now, I still feel very uncomfortable. The chance to attend a retreat annually is so rare, and it was ruined. Have you realized that the assistant timekeeper was mean to you only once, and yet you were mean to yourself ten times? Was I really mean to myself? I'm speaking the truth. All right. All of you, please follow my instructions. Let's calm ourselves down. Be clearly aware of the sensation of your buttocks touching the ground. Be clearly aware of the relaxation on the face. Extend the sensation of relaxation downwards. Be clearly aware of the relaxing sensation around the neck. Release the pressure from the shoulders. Do not exert force on the shoulders. Extend the relaxing sensation to the arms, the palms, the fingers. Be clearly aware of the relaxation in the chest and the abdomen. Be clearly aware of the relaxing sensation on the back and waist.
After you have calmed down, make no judgments. Let go of your viewpoints temporarily and simply recall that incident. Recall, for instance, the appearance of that assistant timekeeper, the unfolding of that incident, and then the situation of you and the Chan Hall. Then try to be aware and see what you will discover. I feel that it is difficult to simply recall that scene. It's become rather difficult. The process of the incident has become more fragmented and interrupted. And I only remember that the person seemed to have short hair, with a stern facial expression. The image is rather blurred. Then for me to recall that feeling of being offended and upset is not really that clear. Well, very good. So, now what do you think about that incident? I feel there's something different. After calming down after that incident and that person, my emotions are not as strong. However, I feel it is because I haven't seen that person very often. If it's someone that I will see often, I suppose it would be different, right? What about this? You should be able to see your mother more often. When you think of your mother, do you believe that it is her? That's my mother, of course. If it were not her, would that be an image I create out of nothing? When you think of your mother, is the image emerging in your mind clear? Yes, it's clear. At least it's clearer than that of the assistant timekeeper. Let's assume it is as clear as a photograph. Do you have a picture of your mother on your mobile phone? If you do, please show it. All right. Let me ask you, regarding this picture of your real mother, are there any differences? It's the same. That's exactly my mother. What about the rest of you? Has anyone discovered any differences? When I see my mother in real life, she moves and talks. But the one in the picture doesn't. The real person smiles. She will respond when I speak to her, but the one in the picture won't. What if it's a film? People in film also move and talk and laugh. Right. I can point out that there are 10,000 possible differences, or even a million ones. In terms of mobility, people in a photo don't move, and people in a film move only in a fixed way. Your real mother can choose to move in many possible ways in every given moment. Or she may choose to stand or lie down. The changes in the state of her muscles and bones can have many possibilities. When you are feeling sad, your real mother will comfort you and hug you. But not so the mother in the picture. When you are hungry, your real mother can cook for you but not so the mother in the picture. And when you look at her expressions, you can see a wide range of emotions and reactions in every moment. Aren't they constantly changing? Moreover, when you give presents, do you give them to your mother in the picture or to your mother in reality? Who will receive the presents and who will be happy? We could go on like this. In our daily life, whether speaking or keeping silent when interacting with others, only a real person can act with such vitality. Someone's picture does not have the same ability. The most essential point is the picture does not have a mind, whereas the real person does. The image appearing in your mind is just like a photo. That being said, I still find it difficult to analyze the given experience. Just now, as you recall that assistant timekeeper, by observing your own experience, were you able to interact with the image that has just emerged? Is there a mind involved? Well... These observations are not derived from intellectual thinking or deduction. Otherwise, they will become mere reasoning. Sometimes reasoning may be useful, but it can also become an obstacle. That's why just now I advise you to relax and calm down for a while without making any judgments. Let go of your viewpoints and simply observe the image appearing in your mind. 
That brief experience just now has indeed made a notable impact on me. I realized that the content appearing in my mind mostly just reflected my personal emotions and judgments. That incident could hardly reappear in my mind exactly the way it happened. As to the fact that the image in my mind is not her, that is, not my mother in reality, I'm still not quite sure, but I'll try to contemplate that. Very good. Simply believing may be useful, but it is what we have realized that matters more. Good. I'll practice hard when I return home. In my dream, wasn't my mother reproaching me? It was clearly just a dream and my mother couldn't possibly enter my dream. Was it really her that I dreamed of? Was the one being scolded in the dream the real I? The feeling of being wronged in the dream is now all gone. All that appeared in the dream was just something I created myself as a phenomena formed by my thoughts. There was no rebuking mother, nor was there a self being rebuked. What Fasha talked about, the mother in your mind is not your mother in reality. Now I can seem to understand a little more. From the description of what you experienced after waking up from your dream, did you feel that it was a brand new discovery? Yes, I discovered that within the image of my mind, there is in fact no real person. Images from the past memory may still appear, but my attitude towards them started to change. From then on, my sitting practice became more effective, not like before when I often found myself struggling between the method and my wandering thoughts. I won't get entangled by this person or that incident. I can let go very quickly and then continue to use the method. Correct. We normally treat our deluded thoughts like they are real, and then we try very hard to get rid of them. When we realize that there is neither an actual person nor event in our thoughts, but simply mentally perceived objects from our shadowy memories, we'll be able to better understand what the sutra says. To mistake the four great elements as the attributes of their bodies, and conditioned impressions of the six sense objects as the attributes of the mind. In the images appearing in the mind, there is no person, no self, and no event. However, we distortedly think they exist, and thus constantly struggle with these illusions. When realizing that the images are illusory, we don't need to change our thinking, or make any effort to eliminate our vexations. This is like mistaking a rope for a snake. With our mind thus generating fear, then we strive to remove the fear, or persuade ourselves that snakes are also sentient beings. So, we should have compassion for snakes. We try to change our mentality without realizing that, actually, we have the wrong perception. When we can see clearly that a rope is a rope, then there is nothing to deal with or change. Similarly, taking the mental image as the real person or the other party is exactly like seeing a rope as a snake. When we realize that there is neither actual person nor event, but only thoughts, just like the illusion of a rope being mistaken for a snake, we can naturally let go of them easily. Yes, I'm very grateful to Fasha. I find Chan to be indeed most useful, because in our daily life we often use recollection and memory. Although I still fall into my habitual tendencies, I now have a new perspective to observe how I approach recollections and memories, thereby helping myself reduce stress and inner conflict. This will also enhance my faith in Chan practice. The Complete Enlightenment Sutra says, What is ignorance? Virtuous man, since beginningless time, all sentient beings have had all sorts of delusions, like a disoriented person who has lost his sense of direction. They mistake the four great elements as the attributes of their bodies and the conditioned impressions of the six sense objects as the attributes of their minds. They are like a man with an illness of the eyes who sees an illusory flower in the sky or a second moon. Virtuous man, there is in reality no flower in the sky, yet the sick man mistakenly clings to it. Because of his mistaken clinging, he is not only deluded about the intrinsic nature of empty space, but also confused about the rising of the flower. Because of this false existence to which he clings, he remains in the turning wheel of birth and death. Hence, this is called ignorance.